Good afternoon, students. My name is Dr. Tachycardia, and welcome to my first of many web series. This one is entitled Fun with P. <clears throat> and uh, no, but seriously, <clears throat> we are going to have some fun with P. But the technical term for this is urinalysis. Uh, more specifically, a clinical urinalysis. This all represents the sort of tests that would be done in a clinical lab or at your doctor's office when they do a routine urinalysis and you end up peeing into a cup. All right, so I'll go through uh, them in order, starting with specific gravity right here and then pH, the same order as in your lab handout demonstrating how to do the different tests and experiments. And the first one I'm going to start with is right here. <clears throat> this I've got abbreviated as SG. This stands for specific gravity. And before I get into the details, specific gravity, what does that mean? It has nothing to do with gravity. <clears throat> really what it refers to is density. What we have, of course, is we're testing urine. This is actually fake urine, but if it was real urine, it would be the same thing, only different. The idea being, any time you have urine, you have an aqueous solution. It's mostly water. <clears throat> we know what water feels like, how much it weighs, 1.000 uh, grams per deciliter, something like that. <clears throat> anyway, once you start adding stuff to your water, your aqueous solutions, salts, sugars, those all have a much higher molecular weight than water, which is this H2NO, easy math. Okay, the formula weight is 18. But uh, sodium chloride, it's more like 52. Glucose, 180 grams per mole. Sucrose, more like 320 grams per mole. So any time you start dissolving substances in the fluid, it increases the density of it. So it's really about density, not gravity. And so what that means is the result of this is going to be pretty close to water. Hmm. Same as American beer. Anyway. And what we're going to see is just a little bit of change. So we're going to end up with numbers like 1.0 something, which is really close to water, but a little bit heavier. And uh, so the first thing I need to do here is take my urine sample, <clears throat> add it to this cylinder. It's called a urinometer cylinder. And this thing here that floats up and down <clears throat> is called the urinometer. And I know that because it says right on the back, in case I get too nervous, it says urinometer. So I'm going to put this, actually, normally we start it like this. I'm going to add the urine first to the cylinder. Oops, forgot my goggles. In case it splashes, I don't want fake pee and sodium chloride in my eyes. <clears throat> right, so that's pretty good. The thing is, you want to be careful when you put the urine in here first because of the principle of Archimedes. You don't want this to overflow the cylinder and spill all over the table. So if you don't remember the principle of Archimedes, this means you have to watch more of the Big Bang Theory because I've seen two episodes where Sheldon Cooper explains it very, very well indeed. So I'm going to put this cylinder now, excuse me, urinometer into the cylinder, and lo and behold, it floats. I love it when it works. Physics is great. It has to be floating. If it's sitting on the bottom, that tells you nothing except that it can sit on the bottom. Now, floating, it's not so hard. The trick is trying to read these little numbers and graduations on the side of that thing which means you have to get down low and you have to squint right at the meniscus of the fluid, see where it hits the side of the stem of the urinometer cylinder. I'm going to twist it just a little bit. And if you ever have to do this in a clinical situation, I'm going to trust that your eyes are younger than mine and that you can see it. <clears throat> Normally, what you're going to see is way up at the top, it says 1.000. That's the density of pure water. Way down at the bottom of the stem, it says 1.060, which is more like the density of uh, Great Salt Lake or something like that. In between is about the uh, density of seawater, about 1.025. So between 1.01, about down to 1.025 seawater, that's um, 
fairly normal range. It varies throughout the day, which is why this is not particularly diagnostic of pathology. If you've been drinking a lot of water, it's, the mark is going to be way up here by 1.000. If you've gone all day and you haven't drank much, it might be more like 1.020. If you measure this in the morning when you haven't drunk any water for 10 hours, you're going to have a higher number like 1.020 than if you've been drinking fluids all day. So it's not particularly diagnostic unless it's out of the normal range. Okay. <clears throat> right. So that's specific gravity. The next sort of general test that we'll be doing, or that I'll show you how to do actually because you can't be here, is pH. And this is my beaker of urine here, and this is my pH meter shown here, and it's a nice handy dandy battery operated electrical pH meter, not a big fancy bulky thing. I hate using those. So the first step with any pH meter electrode is I'm going to do this. The <clears throat> law requires that we rinse this off with fluid, deionized water, see? deionize water in order to clean it when we start and then to clean it again when we finish. Operation is very simple because it's got this button down here that says, or it implies power, something you'd see on a computer. I just turn the power on like so. I dip it, okay, I dip it into the uh, urine solution like so. It just happens to fit in a 50 ml beaker like this. And then you wait and you wait and you wait patiently. Uh, as if you were sitting through a long commercial break on Discovery Channel. The idea is the numbers are supposed to change and they're supposed to stabilize. This doesn't have a big light that comes on when it's done. So you have, just have to wait until it stabilizes and it stops changing. And that's your pH value. All right, I'm just going to let this sit there so I don't get uh, a finger cramp <coughs> like Sheldon Cooper or somebody might get. And uh, the pH, once again, it's not absolutely diagnostic. We expect it to be a little bit acidic because we produce metabolic acids as part of our normal metabolic activities. So, for example, <clears throat> lactic acid when we exercise, pyruvic acid from the Krebs cycle, carbonic acid from breathing and producing CO2, and even a little bit of keto acids if we're uh, burning a lot of fat and whatnot. Okay, so it's not absolutely diagnostic unless it gets to be too acidic, like less than pH of 5, then that raises up a red flag suggesting we might be producing, or the patient might be producing, too many metabolic acids, which means they could have a metabolic disorder. <clears throat> okay, and that would be the conclusion if that becomes too acidic, or the suspicion. Then you would do further tests, or the doctor would order further tests. Okay, <clears throat> so that's pH. It's not hard to do. <clears throat> you just have to be patient and wait for the bloody thing to stop changing. Okay, so those two were relatively general, not absolutely diagnostic. What I'm going to switch to next is a test for proteins. Okay, <clears throat> and a uh, fancy word for this, protein urea. We want to test the urine and see if it has proteins in it. If it does, it's called protein urea, logical name, proteins in urine. Okay, and the way I'm going to do this, I'm not going to use one of those um, bloody test strips that they sell because those are way too boring. <clears throat> I'm going to start like this, and I'm going to just show you that uh, I have this test tube with urine already in it, prepared a little bit ahead of time. And the procedure involves taking your test tube of urine and using a clamp placing it here in a boiling water bath, which I forgot to turn up, so it's only kind of simmering. It's not really boiling. <clears throat> I want it to be better, but I forgot to steal any dry ice from the chem lab. <clears throat> anyway, so we're supposed to boil that and let it cook for about 10 to 15 minutes to be on the safe side. So I'm going to take out this particular test tube, like so. <clears throat> This one has been boiled, but I don't want you to just sit there for 15 minutes <clears throat> totally getting bored. So I'm going to put it down here for just a second. I'm going to leave that clamp on there. The next phase of this involves, I'm going to take some of this. Let's see if it's labeled. 1% <clears throat> acetic 
acid is, it's called. It's obviously a type of acid. And I'm going to drop several drops in there. One, two, three, four, five. Like so. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to take off the clamp. And I'm going to mix it gently and carefully. It's a little warm, but it's not very warm at the top. We want to mix it in a gentle way like so that isn't too dangerous, like that. And then as a result, I can see it's changed a little bit. I want to uh, put this in here. <clears throat> then take a control test tube that has not been boiled and put it right there next to it. And I'm hoping that I've put a little bit of paper behind it, paper with printing is the way I like to do it, that you can see, with any luck, that there's a difference between this tube and this tube, a difference in cloudiness, a difference in turbidity. I don't know if that's entirely visible to you, but if it is, good, because <clears throat> that's what it's supposed to do. The idea being we're testing for proteins. You know how sensitive proteins are. <clears throat> their um, tertiary and quaternary structure very sensitive to two things. Temperature, there, <clears throat> with the boiling, and pH here with the acid. The idea is hitting this urine with high temperature and acidic pH. If there's protein in there, it denatures the proteins. That changes them. That makes them act more like a precipitate. And it makes the solution turn cloudy. That indicates you've got protein urea, protein in the urine which um, can be pathological. Ultimately, urine comes from blood. It's filtered blood. Now, the plasma proteins in your blood should not be getting into your urine unless you've got a problem, let's say, with your kidneys and the plasma proteins are leaking out. Definitely not a good thing. That's pathological protein urea. Okay, so I'm going to take a short break now. I'm going to set up some more stuff for the next several tests that we need to do for this lab. And I'll be um, back shortly with part two of Fun with Pete.